everybody, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. I am Cammy Black. Um, we've got a packed show for you this evening. We are going to be talking about the Women's World Cup squad that's just been announced. We'll do our full Six Nations preview, a bit of a chat about the under-20s. Um, and then we'll Johnny will give us a Doddy Aid update. Is your spreadsheet up to date, Doddy? Uh, Johnny? It is up to date, yeah. I, I've seen it every week, so it's ready. Good. We'll look forward to that and seeing how um, how Ian McGilp's single-handedly carrying the entire Barbarian squad. It's offensive, it is. honestly. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't give away too much, but it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you'll hear him there. Joining me tonight, we've got Johnny McGinty. Good evening, Johnny. Good evening. How are we doing? Dressed up tonight, Johnny, because you, you dressed up for the Blood and Mud podcast. <laughs> We're not so, having to say show on again. tonight. I, I explained myself. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> uh, also join us, we've got Craig Manson. Good evening, Craig. Good evening, all. How are we doing? And we've got watching the football. We've got Ian here. Good evening, Ian. Good. That's uh, pushing it. Hello, Evening, everyone. Ian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> evening, all. Uh, hello, sorry. Also, my headset's annoying me. It's, I've got a weirdly shaped head. But hello, everyone. Anyway, back to... Cammy, take over. Yeah, fine. Anyway, if you are watch, you can watch us live um, on a Wednesday evening about half past eight, generally on a Wednesday, sometimes on a Thursday, but we're live on uh, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. You can also download the podcast uh, in audio format on all good podcast platforms like Google Podcasts, Spotify, um, and um, Apple Podcasts. I did try and remove some Spotify, but it was too hard. But then luckily, <laughs> um, Spotify made Joe Rogan apologize. Um, I don't know if Neil Young's gone back on yet, but I couldn't do a Neil, sadly. <laughs> I did I did I did consider it at one point, but it didn't work. But anyway, you'll get no COVID misinformation on this podcast. That's all I'm saying. We don't have to read out any disclaimers from Spotify here. Anyway, um you can also sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast for three pounds a month, and you get bonus weekly uh, content where we do an extra podcast every week with a bit more chat um, from, from all of us as well. Um, anyway, this week's podcast, like I said, we're going to start. Um, Brian Eason Craig has announced his uh, squad for the World Cup qualifier in Dubai, which is still either against, um, who is it, um, Colombia or Kazakhstan? Is it still Colombia and Kazakhstan? Uh, yes, yeah, it is. Um yeah, that's going to be that's uh, going to be an interesting one. Yeah, he was talking about that. Funnily enough, he was saying about um, how he's uh, they're going to have to, they, they they got a little bit um, uh, complacent when Japan went down to fourteen, um, and then they're, they're, he's trying to make sure they don't get complacent because they're ranked 
fairly high in the world compared to the other the other teams are going to play and they need to make sure that they take take them on properly you know so yeah it is different though i guess isn't it because with men's rugby because of the way the test schedule works and the six nations works johnny as a as a as scotland i guess in and within the world top 10 we get a chance to test ourselves every year against know, the top 10 12 teams in the world so you get a really good idea of where you stand and where you fit with and all that. But it must be really hard for the women's team because, yeah, they play the Six Nations and they're probably there or thereabouts with Wales, Ireland and Italy. But outside of that, all of the teams kind of in the top 20, I guess, it's probably hard to kind of judge because we they don't play tests in the same way. Yeah, I think just because of kind of where women's rugby is and its development, there's not as many opportunities and when you're when you're not a full time player, an overseas tour of a bunch of tests is, is not an option very often. Um, so hopefully, you know, as we kind of start to evolve to more professional squads, that that'll start to get better. But at the moment, you do what you can do, I guess. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, that interview you mentioned, Craig, was really interesting. I was watching it tonight before we came on here, and Brian Eason was saying that the SRU are now providing financial and other assistance to the women rugby players, either to allow them to drop down part-time at their jobs, to help them do their jobs and have rugby, to speak to the universities on their behalf and to make sure that they can train alongside doing those day jobs. And it seemed to be, I mean, from what he was saying, it seemed to all have kind of been driven by the coaching staff. And that's, we don't know the ins and outs of it, but it's, it's a, it's a, good step forward you would think yeah it's it's brian and the other coaching staff are in a really difficult situation because they've got uh, on one hand they've got um the sru who are paying their wages um and who are holding the purse strings and are trying to make sure that they get um a, a, a huge amount of performance for the for their pound um but he's also got um the the athletes themselves, people like us, shouting at them, saying they need to start paying, um, paying the players, and 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 giving these athletes the ability to perform as professional athletes, and and so it, it's a really difficult balance for them. What it what what it seems what seems to come across in the interview is that that he's, um they've 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 kind of gone to them and said, what do you need to take take one step maybe one more percent or take, you know, give you a, a, an easier life. Um, whether it's money, whether it's 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 a conversation with the university, say, look, give them a bit of a break on on, on certain things, give them, you know, give them extra time or whatever it is, because these these um, these players are, are, are going off, you know, are trying to train, giving them extra time, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it seems to be a good compromise for them right at this moment in time. Yeah, for now, I guess. I mean, it's not something... Um... Ian, I guess that Gregor Townsend has to contend. He's not going to have to kind of sit down with Johnny Gray and ask him how you're going to fit in training with your your day job. I don't know, man. You know what extra chiefs in the Premiership are like? <laughs> <laughs> extra game? No, 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 no release for you. I'm yeah. sorry. I think it should be put a content warning on just because I'm smoking. Sorry, this is it's fine. No, this, it's fine. I think you're all right. It's, it's a cigarette, Ian. Yeah. We're fine. I don't Spotify, I aren't going to cancel us for that. Oh, yeah, well, Joe Rogan and Elon Musk smoked a joint on uh, their thing. They did, that's very true. Yeah. But they've got millions and millions of listeners as well. So <laughs> yeah, but, you know, bringing, well, bringing millions of pounds of revenue quality. for their hosts. So. Yeah, who are scumbags. <laughs> very true. Very Joe true. Rogan's are... not funny. Like, I watched one of these no, stand-up specials, he's not funny at all. Um, I've had to put up with him for years on UFC commentary, it's like, why is this guy on UFC? He's just a comedian. I saw him described as a comedian in something well, about Spotify and genuinely had no idea that that was what he did. I don't think I've ever seen him be funny once in my life. I thought he was just a UFC no. commentator. Yeah. I don't even know what UFC is. Is it fighting? Yeah. I thought that was um, a rugby champion. I thought it was a rugby yeah, champion. Yeah, it's the old one. I thought it was Glasgow. <laughs> Fighting rugby championship. Hey, back to rugby. Anyway. It's French division too. Um, <laughs> Ian, you were at the tennis women's final on the weekend, weren't you? No, no, I wasn't. We no, not, I Car- thought you Car- was. Heatley was. No, I was. Uh, was. I thought he was. I was at GHA. 
Um, oh, so I had the G H A V um, Aberdeen Grammar. Yeah, it's interesting though. I suppose that there were. I saw there was an interview with um, one of the players on the Scotland official channel talking about the standard of rugby, women's rugby in, in Scotland is really improving. And I think although that's a, you know, it's a step in the right direction, it's still not full professional rugby for women in Scotland. Uh, no, we're near it, and it was, well, by the look of the score, uh, it was a rather one-sided final. Um, so it really shows that we need to level up a bit. Although, to be kind of honest, in the men's um, Premiership, um, Curry are just slamming everyone, even Mar. Um, and Mar are, I mean, this season, well, last season and this, well, the cancel season and this season, it's been Curry and Mar. But Curry seemed to have taken that extra step um, between between the breaks, and they are completely dominant right now. Um, just as what's holding him, seem to be. Yeah, yeah, the thing is, though, if you if you look at the breakdown of the of of all the all the players involved in the Scotland team, though, it, it's um, you you have to you know probably what it must be. 85 90 percent are from are now playing professionally in, in, in England um yeah. and then the, the 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 new players that are coming through the uncapped players are coming from Edinburgh uni um which is a um I, I, I'm not going to say that they're a, a, an annex of the SRU but I know that they're supported by you know their coaching staff at, 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 at Edinburgh uni are in, are, are in, uh, incredibly professional um and could step from Edinburgh uni to Scotland you know they are um or to a professional outfit they are very very high level coaches at, at Edinburgh uni and they're constantly especially in the women's game they're pushing for um um uh I've forgotten the name of it, but the the, the championship for for universities, the pushing for wins there. So we we, we have to be very careful. Um, again, I'm going to bang the drum again. We have to be very careful on 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 what if you look at the Super Six and how how the Super Six is supposed to be um, feeding the professional teams as well as all the academies. We, we need that to be happening with the the Premiership, um, or, uh, the Women's Premiership. Um, in Scotland yeah. as well, it should be feeding. It used to be that way, and you used to, you know, when we first started playing with the How Harlequins, you would get drawn in the cup against Hillhead, or, or and, and you're going up against Scotland players. But you're now at a situation where these Scotland players are now having to go off um, and 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 find um, uh, more support and also play their professional rugby in England. So we just have to be careful with that. It's seven out of the thirty are Scottish based, Scotland based, Johnny. I think that's quite a quite telling. I mean, it's great that I suppose that the the rest of the squad are at a standard where they're playing down in England, um, you know, in, in really good standard of competition. But the, the downside to that is that I suppose it makes it high, high, harder for Brian Easton to then get access to them outside of the international windows. Yeah, and you know that's something that obviously Ian's kind of mentioned that we do have a bit of a problem with with the men's team as well but it's a very small problem with the men's team where it's it's now quite a serious problem with the women's team if you're only getting what 20 percent ish of your squad whenever you need them you can't really build on very much from that especially when sort of by the very nature of it your core players and the ones who you're looking to be in the leadership positions and things are the ones who are professional and, and who are away with outfits in England and France, it makes it really, really difficult with that sort of limited exposure to your players. Yeah. I think what we've said before, what we want as a professional women's team, a bit like the uh, the, the the Jaguars in uh, Argentina, but with a with a and, and with an amazing mascot obviously. Yeah. Haguardina for us, please. There's already there's already Haguardina. I don't know what she's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, a, there's a picture. There's a picture of of, of him and her doing sexy dancing in the middle of the pitch during a game. <laughs> the tango. Yeah, let's stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's I mean the what the last interesting thing I suppose about the, we should say about the women's squad is they've called up um I'll get the name right. It's uh Katie Matteson, who is a scrum half who was capped for England in twenty seventeen and twenty eighteen, Craig, but um has come under the new three year rule. Yes, three can, year rule, yeah. Not capped for three years, you can you can um can turn up for you another country you qualified for yeah and uh, I, I, again it's someone that maybe we have lost 
to England because of the professional setup. She was born in Inverness. Um, she's Scots qualified, um, uh, but she went and played. She got I think five five or eight caps for England, um, and uh, she's she's from what Brian's saying and from what we've been told in the interviews is she's incredibly keen to play for Scotland now. Obviously, it's going to extend her international life, and that's that's. Um, uh, you know that's a driving force, but also she's playing for Worcester Warriors. Um, so you know, yeah, I think I think with without you know, I want to change my output from negative to positive. I think what Brian's doing is he's putting together um, as strong a squad as he possibly can um, and preparing for the World Cup. Okay, we've got a we've got a, we've got to qualify yet. Um, but I think it's a it's a it's a road bump along the road to the World Cup, and I think uh, not to sound too um, up ourselves, I think we should be able to get get through and qualify. And uh, he, he seems to be putting together a very very strong squad. So fingers crossed, you know. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that it's it's interesting, Johnny, having someone of that experience come into Scotland women is something that maybe haven't had before because you've had about Jade Conkle's been around since year dot and you know obviously was the first Scottish pro but to have somebody who's been you know away with England to come in and feed that into the squad's got to be a huge boost. Yeah. I mean I don't think it's massively hyperbolic to say that the Red Roses are probably the best sports team in the world or one of the best sports teams in the world at the moment. So having someone who's been around that sort of atmosphere and, and that kind of setup can be really, really beneficial, especially for a team like Scotland who, you know, like we say, don't get access to that many of their players that often are trying to drill a lot of stuff in not a lot of time. To have someone who's used to a really professional atmosphere like that, who's able to come in and especially in a position like scrum half, eh, it's going to be a massive benefit, I would think. Kind of reminds me of Danny Bruff when he went to the, the rugby league team. Yeah. And I mean, also yeah. like to sort of go along with what Johnny was saying and gives us a chance to see where we are in the world because, well, Scotland's women team where they are in the world because they don't get to play anyone really apart from the Six Nations teams and then like South Africa who we pummeled. Um, but England seems to be pummeling everyone. So, you know, seems to be, if they are so far ahead, if they are your, your Curry or your Watsonians uh, women's side, then where do we fit in, in the hierarchy? Yeah, and, I suppose, like we said, to... and like we said in previous pods, it's about making sure we're not getting left behind mm. as well. Very yeah. much so. Indeed. Bye. Go on, pro. It, that is it, I think, for the women's side for the moment. Um, let's do um, let's do the Six Nations then, our, our Six Nations preview. Um, we'll, we'll start with Scotland. I thought probably we can go through the fixture list and kind of talk about the other teams because it's probably worth doing in a preview podcast. Although there was Scottish Rugby podcast, we can talk about them from the point of view view of being our opposition. Um, we've talked about the squad previously, Ian, but kind of with the chopping and change, we've got the world's most beautiful man, trademark Alan Dells, coming. Um, we've maybe you know uh, Ollie Kebbles continued um, exclusions a bit baffling, but. How you, uh, you how do you feel about the squad overall, Ian? Still, um, apart from the standoff thing, uh, I, th- I think we've got some incredible strength and depth, um, particularly at centre. Uh, you know, I mean, it seems like Chris Harris is nailed on at thirteen, even though there's some cracking players behind him. Uh, and at twelve, we don't know. Like Sam Johnson has performed very well uh, when picked, uh, called on for Scotland. I think. Um, even against South Africa, well, not Scott didn't play particularly well against South Africa, so not that Johnson would have played better, they just weren't great. Um, but obviously, Cammy Redpath's back, uh, and we know what he can bring, especially with uh, him being outside Finn Russell. It's you know, we don't like to get too optimistic here, um, as, as was shown last week, but it's a good squad. Um, uh, I don't really know what else to say. And also, you know, guys, even who's going to be on the bench too? Pilotto's in great form. Kinghorn's likely to be there as uh, an all-round cover. Um, are we going 6-2 split? It's a, it's a very strong squad. What I'm worried, what I kind of like thought today, Johnny, and I was watching the you know they put Mark Bennett up for an interview on the SR YouTube channel. And it's it's not a it's not an exact science. 
who they put up for interview on that channel as to who's likely to be in the mix. But it got me thinking that you know we we probably would could sit here and say this that's you know this is Scotland's strongest starting fifteen, and we'd all probably agree with kind of eighty percent of it. But it's Gregor Townsend, and just part of me wonders. I don't think he's he's ever in the month of Sundays dropping Chris Harris, but putting someone like Mark Bennett on the bench isn't outside the realms of possibility for as something that Gregor Townsend would do. Yeah, you just have to look at last year's Calcutta Cup with Cam Redpath and Dave Cherry, who came from pretty much nowhere, and both ended up. To be fair to them, played a huge part in winning that game. It's uh, it's something of a toony special to just just throw something completely random at the wall and, and see what happens. And you know, like Ian says, centre is the place where there's so many options. And it, like, I think almost any of those combinations is a decent couple of centres. So that's the one where, apart from you know, we don't think anything's going to happen to Chris Harris's position. Anyone could be outside him, inside him. Sorry, and we'll have to wait and see. I guess who's the? I mean, I suppose it's probably easier to talk, Craig, about who who's nailed on for Scotland. You, I mean, Ali Price, Finn Russell, Chris Harris, Hogg, Hog. Duhan, Jamie Ritchie, Ritchie. Jamie Ritchie. Yeah. yeah, I think I think Jamie Ritchie. I think um, uh, Scott Cummings. Um, I think Xander will start, um, but then you've got the juxtaposition of Rory Sutherland and and, and the Greatest Showman. Um, you've got um, George Turner. I think will is pretty much nailed on, although you've got um, you know McAnally seems to have, seems to be all smiles at training. Um, uh, so you, you just you just don't know, and also the big thing for me is is that is whether it's a six two split or a five a five three split because if it's a five three, then if you're talking about Mark Bennett, he could be in the mix to cover the centres, and then you've got Blair Kinghorn who covers everywhere else, and then and you'll have Ben Velikot as well. So there's uh, it's, and Bennett, it, Bennett covers the wings as well, though. So yeah, yeah. But isn't it interesting that? Of all the nailed on starters, none of us said Hamish Watson just because of how good Rory Darge has been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think I think it's a mixture of Rory Darge is on is, is doing incredibly well, and Hamish Watson just hasn't clicked since he's come back from the Lions. Um, although he had a great game against um, against Breeve, but. Um, as John Anderson seems he's not here, I may as well say, well, or, or as John, as Johnny said in the last pod when I wasn't here, um, uh, apparently it was it was Breeve's fourth team or a part time side or something like that. Um, so a bunch of plumbers, uh, aye, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, a bunch of a bunch of fish who can eye gouge and plumbers that came up for them. No, I think uh, it'll be interesting. Um, Ham- to see. Hamish Watson, yeah, Hamish Watson's an interesting one though because. I would be surprised if he doesn't start because he's got it's the one player I think with enough credit in the bank to start and you could throw him in and it's a test match and I I don't think he put a foot wrong. I don't think he's playing so badly that he's you would ought that I mean but it's Gregor Townsend we're talking about, so he might do, but I, I don't think Watson's playing so badly that he would get dropped. On the flip side, imagine what he'd be like after sitting on the bench for 50 minutes watching. I yeah, can imagine it, him coming on like like the Tasmanian devil. It's in the same sequence. sequence. Yeah. <laughs> but, you, but you have that the other way around. If I, if I was coaching, if I was co- the coach or making the decision, I would start Hamish Watson and then have Rory Darge as a, a break glass for emergency because you want to bring him on and and you, you've got, he's got, you know, this, this, you know, Tasmanian devil of a of a of a, um, a, a a seven come on and absolutely rip it up. So again, and it's the same thing as you're saying. You've got the ability to bring him on and 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 absolutely rip it up in the in the second half if you need to. What was the Tony Tombola? I mean, Christy, I think usually plays six, doesn't he? But could we see Christy at seven? I think not, probably on the bench not against is a England. cover option, if yeah. anywhere. It's that thing. I think Rory Dodge is a well. Rory Dodge and Hamish Watson. You can't if, if you're going for a five-three split. You're not going to get either of those on the bench. Not sure. Specialists no. seven, but 
But I think if you get the 6-2 split, then that's that's where you can afford to have one of them on the bench because you can shift dev- you know, you can have somebody on the park that be, can be shifted around. Mm. But you could always yeah. have one of them on the bench if the other if, if on a five three if the other loose forward on the bench was Sam Skinner. Well, that's true. And and also given that when Watson ended up playing number eight against France, and I think I'm right in thinking he has played eight in the past occasionally, I think, when needed for Ember as well, Craig. Yeah, and so is Jamie Ritchie. Um, uh, I've seen him play as well, so so there's there is ability there. Um, so what you know, we're talking about this. I remember talking about the Scotland squad. It was either the autumn or the or the or the the last Six Nations, and it just came out and it was totally and utterly the wrong way around. So you know, <laughs> you just you just don't know, do you? But I think that's a, but that's a good thing for we've not had this in the past. I think any any opposition that are going to come up against Scotland in the past would know our starting fifteen and be able to kind of spend weeks preparing on how they were going to pick apart our starting 15. But now, if you're Eddie Jones and his coaching staff thinking, well, who's he going to pick this week? They haven't got... They, they won't, they'll be sat here like us. They won't have a bloody clue who he's going to pick. Yeah. Especially if it's scrum half replacement. Ben Velikop. Well, there you go. Velikop. Ben Velikop. But Or, well, Scott Steele jumped ahead of the pecking order last season. Will, uh, he... will White be the same? Ben White, mm-hmm. yeah. But then you don't know what, what he's been doing at training, you know, you just don't know how they've been how they've been going. I actually was funnily enough, and you're going to laugh about this because you know it's typical me and me and my cult thinking, but um uh I, I actually was having a wee little giggle to myself, thinking to myself, wouldn't it be really good to see Blair Kinghorn be named as a starter? Now okay, fair enough, <laughs> oh Finn, Finn, but you know, Eddie again, it's this thing of Eddie Jones knows what he's getting with him, Russell. Does he yeah. know what he's Nobody getting with Blair knows Finn Russell but, doesn't know what he's getting with Finn Russell, Craig. That's true. That's very true. That's very true. But, um, but I know. I take no, it, but it's it's not. Again, we sit here and think that's not outside. What what uh, something the that, realms of Tony Bill the realms of two Tony possibilities. <laughs> that is exactly the sort of thing that Gregor Townsend would do and stick Finn Russell on for the last. I think if he was doing that, you'd get fifty minutes out of Kinghorn. And bring Finn on yeah, half an hour at least. Yeah. I was going to say, depending on how his performance is, if uh, think... it may just be twenty minutes. But um... yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk. We'll do the. We'll talk about the um, England game in a bit more detail on Friday. We'll do our only Finn's preview podcast that we always do when his internationals on, where we'll, we'll we'll stream it for the patrons and we'll put it out on audio format for everybody. Because um, we're recording this on Wednesday. By the time everybody listens to this tomorrow, the squad, the team will be out, so it'll be pretty much redundant anyway. <laughs> but in in terms, but that, it, it is probably Ian the strongest squad Scotland have had in the professional era. Oh, I certainly think so. Um, I especially there's so many. I mean, when we couldn't score a try for what, what, ten years, maybe um, you know the sort of early two thousands. Uh, you now look at the threats we've got on. In the back three, um, obviously, Duhan, the record breaker last year, and top try scorer. Stuart Hogg's a threat. Uh, Darcy Graham, he can score. Ty Pilotto's in great form. Kyle Steen's been scoring a lot. Rufus McLean is a rocket. Um, you know, we've got a lot of threat now um, in attacking positions, and it still just seems to be the, the front row that seems to be an issue. Uh, everywhere else. I mean, like, like I was just saying earlier, you know, the fact that Hamish Watson, we're not putting him down as a guaranteed starter uh, due to Rory Darge is shows what we have, and the fact we don't know who the twelve is. Is the front row concern for you, though, Craig? Because it's hard. I mean, it's hard. I think you kind of like it, it's that. It's the PTSD of being a Scotland fan, and I, and oh, I might touch on this in a bit, but I think there's that eternal kind of doubt in your mind because of Scottish front rows past that we are in eternal trouble in the front row. But I, I'm... I don't see looking it, at it, looking at, yeah, I was going to say, that, like actually thinking about it without the kind of doom and gloom of the past lurking over us, it, we've maybe had got much more parity than we ever have. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, if we go... You've got, you've got Xander Ferguson at tight head, um, who, will, who is... For, fantastic around the field um he 
is a solid performer in the in the scrum. If not, sometimes his technique lets him down. Um, you've got uh, Suz, who is well known within all rugby circles as being one of the best tight uh, loose heads, unless he's unless you're Irish. Um, so he's he's got the he's got the ability there. And then you've got this ability. You know, you've got this 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 revolving door of hookers. Who that doesn't sound great, but anyway, that's a different story. Um, <laughs> you've got you've got this revolving door of hookers of that that you could put any one of the three hookers that are in the squad in, and you would get a you, you would get a, a a decent performance. It then goes to what you go who you're going to replace them with um, at sixty minutes, which is the game now. It, it seems to be the way. Schumann is uh, no, I don't care what anybody says. Schumann is a, should could even start. Um, I think he, he he would be a great starter. He's a, he's a, he's again he's around the field. He's fantastic. The whole Kebble WP Nell situation is slightly different. I think WP Nell will will be on the bench because he can come on and if things are going really really badly in the scrum, he can get penalties out of scrum penalties out of it, out of England, and 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 or whomever they're playing. Um, and he's got that ability. He may not be the most dynamic around the field. But um, I think he will do that. I didn't think that Kebble performed particularly well last week for Glasgow, and I don't think he's been performing that well for Glasgow for a little bit of time. Um, so, it's, it's, as you say, I don't think there's a I don't think there's an issue with the front row. The only thing, I mean, Alan Dell's an interesting one because he's been out of the reckoning for quite a while when he, he kind of like disappeared off a cliff edge when he went down to London Irish because he was struggling to get game time. Yeah. up in Edinburgh obviously you know Edinburgh played London Irish recently is there anything to you that suggests that you know Alan Dell's kind of rediscovered or not even rediscovered discovered maybe you know a kind of superior scrummaging ability uh, I don't know I, I I've not I've not seen you know he's been he's been on the bench quite a bit for London Irish um and I think I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I can't. I don't. Un, I honestly don't understand why they didn't call up Kebble and they brought Alan Dale up. I, you know, I'm not saying that Kebble would Kebble would be a, a viable person to be to be um, sitting on the bench, you know, for the game. But I don't. I didn't understand it. Um, but then I don't understand why we've got um, Scarlett's third third prop. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the squad as well, so uh, and this is why know. I'm concerned because <laughs> it is, it's a very short step from yes, we have shots and Schumann, and then after that, it's whoop, and if you know, then Xander on the other side, Nell is coming back in now. Nell's a great player, I'm not denying that Nell is not a, an absolute scrubbing monster and a fantastic player, but if we're looking forward to the World Cup. Hills now now 35 36 36 yeah I, I, i'm not entirely sure nell will go to the world cup to be perfectly honest precisely I so who is you know if we've got i mean cable's not even as a tight head so it's um sebastian is i think the only other tight head option we have in the squad at the moment yeah, yeah. that's why i'm yeah. concerned well, I think I think we've got a few a few props here, there, and everywhere. I know that we've got McCallum, Murray McCallum, who seems to be performing okay down at Worcester. We've got, um, uh, you know, Jamie Batty's injured. Uh, ooh, that's a good question. I do not know, but uh, I think you, used, you might think be right actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that's one of the players I was really disappointed not to see more of because he is a, a really good workman and he work you know he, he works incredibly hard within. Within um, both Edinburgh it's, and also Glasgow, it's, it's a really hard thing with props because it's such a because it's such a specialised position. It's not. It's so hard to get game time. See, this is why I feel people prop. like Alex Allen and McCallum maybe got maybe not jettisoned, but we brought in the South African project players too quickly to do that. And, you know, give these guys a bit more time to breathe in yeah. that position to learn it. Um, rather than you know having to wait three years for Schumann and Schumann and Kebble are very good, and I've you know I'm big fans of the pair, and um, but yeah, just felt that then there would be you know Edinburgh or Glasgow saying 
someone else from overseas to fill in that space. Someone like Hal, uh, Halo Nukunuka, who really wasn't much cop. You know, yeah. we could have given a, a young Scottish lad more time, which makes me sound like a, one of those people that I hate now. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, yeah, because, it is a, because it is a, a position you have to mature in, it's like a like a fine wine or cheese. But yeah, Sam Laycox and Uchev and Darcy Ray played his best game at the weekend in the Bath game versus Quince. And Darcy Ray, someone that's you know had to go and go to England to get game time. But yeah. It'd be inter- well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, there's people, you know, there's all sorts of permutations. Alistair Duncan, Donald's on face, we're kind of asking us about the different front rows for England. I think the problem is, like I said, by the time this goes out tomorrow, any discussion about who's going up against England is redundant. So we'll, we'll cover that on our preview podcast on Friday. Um, Which other England players are going down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, should we talk? Let's go through the other squads then in terms of um, the, we'll do it in the order of the fixtures. England, Johnny, what, what, what it's a it's a strange one for England because half of the team seems to be going down with COVID. Yeah, uh, the other half, uh, jo- Eddie Jones doesn't you know only picks who Eddie Jones wants to pick, doesn't pick based on form or any other kind of thing other than players whose names he seems to know. So it's kind of hard to know what happened. Yeah, it it it's a weird mix because some fairly interested uncapped players in there. Unfortunately, the one who I really wanted to see and preferably not this weekend. But next weekend is Alfie Barberi from from Wasps, <clears throat> but he's on the COVID. Well, he's on the he's on their unse- unselectable because of injury, and I think it's because of COVID. So we'll not be seeing him this weekend, which is good because he's terrifying. Um, but I think he'll be interested to see through this tournament. If they don't have Joe Marchant back, that's a problem for them because I think if they're going to start Marcus Smith, they probably need Joe Marchant. I'm. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tough one, England, because there's there's a lot of unknowns in there, made all the more unknown by we don't know who's actually going to be available. Yeah, I think I think I was thinking about this, and I think the worry for me, Craig, is if Eddie Jones has his full squad available, you know what's coming because he just picks his favorite players and and he calls these guys up, seems to call these guys up every time he has, has a squad together, and you think, oh, there's a new interesting player. Well, Adam Radwan, he he seems like a promising young lad for. From Newcastle Falcons, but then he, he he never picks them. He just goes with the same guys he's always picked. But now he's his hands being forced. I don't know. Part of me worries that actually you're gonna some of the players that maybe have been overlooked in the past that really shouldn't be overlooked are gonna be given a chance. That that is my absolute concern. Um, I think um, one of you, what someone said in the comments, um, all the optimism for us is is is. Is worrying now, and we're start, we're worried about actually getting rinsed. And if you look at where we are with with some of the players, you know, like Marler's coming back to the squad, so he he's going to be available for select, selection for the weekend. But you've got Don Brandt at eight. There's a good chance that he's he could start at eight. Um, you've you'll have Ben um, Youngs will be yeah, a right. calming factor at nine. Uh, he'll be he'll be dragging his carcass out of his coffin and um, and and going on the field. You've got but Marcus Smith. I think will 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 either wither. Um, you know, you'll have a game like um, uh, like Finn can have where he's quite quiet because of the pressure, um, or you'll you'll absolutely perform. That you'll have Slade at thirteen guaranteed um, because well you know. He's impervious to COVID, um, and uh, and so and then Freddie Stewart definitely at fifteen. So there's there's they're not. I'm certainly not sitting here going, oh, we're going to have it away with them um, because they've got such a you know they've got their they're so they're, they're hit with so many um, injuries and COVID problems. I think we're actually um, could be lulled into a false sense of security. Yeah. What what's your take on England for the tournament as a whole, Ian? Is it is it kind of have they got too many? Kind of injuries and swapping players out to kind of put up a challenge, or well, they have strength and depth, and they have a plan. Um, they've got a tactical mastermind at the helm, as he'd, I'm sure he'd say um, about himself. Mate. Um, yeah, mate. Um, I'm. This is one of these things where I'm worryingly confident. Um, but they still have some cracking players and young guys coming through. Uh, I don't know who'll be 15. Maybe Stewart seems to be quite yeah. handy. 
Mm. Um, so it might be these young guys, you know, come out and perform uh, much in the same way Cammy Redpath did last year. But at the same time, they could falter uh, majestically. Uh, I'm actually trying to look up the the weather because it looked horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Miserable. Yeah, it's miserable. But, uh, Weather can change, you know. Yeah. Butterfly in the Amazon I, and all that. I, th- I think for me, if England, if if Eddie Jones is willing to go, genuinely pick some of the players he selected in the wider squad, and put together England's best kind of fifteen, not just on who's played for England in the past, which always seems to be based on who English people down the pub would pick in their starting fifteen, rather than any kind of coaching <laughs> insight. I I would worry kind of in terms of England, I think England could have a very good tournament. I think if Eddie Jones reverts to type and just selects, you know, Courtney Laws becomes available again, or Courtney's back in to lean against a few rucks and be offside quite a lot. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. Then I think they'll revert to type. I think everyone knows what's coming and every team will be able to see them off quite easily. I think the worrying is because we, we, are, we, are, we are getting them, Johnny, at a point where they're being forced to play players that I don't think Eddie Jones would otherwise even dream of picking in his starting match day squad. Yeah, and I think what worries me about that is that it puts them in quite a similar position to the one that we were in last year, where, you know, like we've already said a few times about Cammy Redpath coming into the team, we had Dave Cherry coming off the bench, and and it was all a bit, it sort of, some positions were a little bit experimental, and and the guys who maybe weren't the core of our squad at the time were were quite hyped up for it. Really wanted to win. Had a couple of things they wanted to put right with England. And England are now basically in that exact position for this weekend. Uh, worries me a little bit. Yeah. What have you got? A quick quick uh, go around then, um, Craig. Final position for England at the end of the tournament. Ooh, that's a great question because they could win it. Um, but they have a very good chance of being fifth. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the problem you have, and as you are going to go through the other squads, if you look at the other squads, um, it's going to be, it could be who puts in, who puts his money, who puts the right amount of points across uh, Italy. Um, who, who, and it depends who you're going to sit in the in the table because I think it's going to be that close. Sorry, that's okay. a really on the fence answer. No, that's Sorry. fine, Johnny. <clears throat> No, I'm, I'm exactly the same. I honestly think that uh, everything from second to fifth, which I think is probably going to be us, France, England and Wales, <clears throat> could be the same amount of tournament points and it could be decided by how many points you beat Italy by. So yeah. any of you us could be second you? or any of us could be fifth, depending on how well we beat Italy. Uh, where do I think England will finish? Fifth. Fifth. Good. Yeah. <laughs> on the nose. Fine. <laughs> Um, we've got Wales next. Yeah, we've got Wales next after England, Ian. Um, I think last year we probably sat here and said Wales are in a transition period, and this is probably the time where we'll we, we'll be able to take them. And there's no way that Wales are winning the tournament. And lo, lo and behold, Wales in a transition year won the tournament. It feels like they're in a transition again. Uh, <laughs> I yes. don't know whether or not to say what what that means now. Um. They seem to always be transitioning, uh, but they do have quite a lengthy injury list. But you know, the one who seems to who seem to overperform, even though we know we should have been sent off last uh, last year before Xander. Um, I don't know. I th- I'm going with fourth for them. Fourth Wales. Uh, yeah, I think like losing Alan Wynn. Um, I, I can't remember who exactly is all on their injury list, but it's lengthy. Uh, I know George North, as per usual, is out. Uh, but they well, seem to have, out again. To yeah, out. Um, they do have quite a lot of decent. Now, Tane Basham looks like a, a decent player. Uh, is Botham? Liam Botham, is he fit? Yeah. Um, yeah, because he uh, plays. He's so he's yeah. So he, was, he, was, as well. he was Yeah, he was stood with yeah. a Papa John's pizza. <laughs> Ken Owens is out. That's uh, mm. where, where we talk about the drop off that we've got maybe at Tighthead. I think the drop off at Hooker in Wales is fairly significant after Ken. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. 
I should probably look up the squad, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 another one, Johnny, isn't it? Where I think Wales, every time you think Wales are beaten and the squad are down to like the bare bones of a squad, there's the the kind of the very average players from the Welsh pro teams then somehow step up and are able to play exceptionally well and somehow scrape these wins that other teams wouldn't in similar circumstances. I don't know if yeah. the luck's going to run out. Maybe the luck will run out this year in that regard. Maybe, I think. The problem is that they, they've been for so long in the position where it's your luck could go either way that at some point you kind of have to acknowledge that they're a team that can get themselves into a game no matter what. You, you can't just kind of look at them even with their injuries as a walkover team because they've still got a lot of talent. And if you're in a position that one incident can decide whether you, you win or lose the game, that means you're good enough to be in that position in every single game. Well, Williams so, is fit. I thought he was injured. Yeah, no, he's... I mean, yeah, they've still got, they've still got Williams. They've still got Lewis yeah. Sammet as well. They've Josh still got Bigger. Yeah. Even with the injury list, it's it's not like you look at it uh, and think, oh, we, we'll walk past them. It yeah. could be a situation, I've though, been... that it's it's like the dam breaking, though, I think. I think it could be that they go over to Dublin and get absolutely slammed. Um, and then to go to go with their documentary. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think... Um, I think you'll. Feel, I think there could be a situation where you, it just it's like a dam breaking, and all of a sudden we all pile in. And I think we all. Uh, I think Scotland have got an incredibly good chance of of beating them down at the Millennium, um, uh, and, yeah. and and silencing the crowd. You know, I think at some point Wales. I do think the luck will run out, and I do yeah. think the structural issues within Welsh rugby are going to start to tell at some point at national level. I think this this year might be the year, like you said, with if, if some of the couple of the older heads are out. And you know they've got I think Wayne Pivax necessarily won over the entire Welsh public either. I'm just you know I think at some point the fact that the resources are stretched in Wales have got this ridiculous Gatland law for for the number of caps that they're going to get to a point where they're a squad of mediocre players, and when the big names that have been there for years are aren't available anymore the the kind of will find a bit I suppose it's probably a bit like what Scotland found themselves in the early 2000s under Matt Williams yeah. you know we had we had a pretty decent squad throughout the 90s people forget that but actually from 1990 to 99 that the Scotland squad we, we were competitive most years in the in the five nations I think Wales are probably in that point now in the kind of Matt Williams era is at, at some point and for I think Scotland was about 2001 where the wheels came off and then mm. came off for the best part of 15 years, admittedly. Wales might be able to turn it around more than that. We don't know. But um, yeah, I think this is the year Wales' wheels will come off. I'm going to to predict that now and upset our Welsh listeners because we do have some. (laughs) Sorry, Phil. Um, (laughs) um, After Wales, then we've got uh, it's France, then on the 26th of Feb. Johnny France, France is a hard one. Here's what I think about France. Scotland have just as good a squad as France do, but because they're French and everyone thinks French rugby is amazing, everyone have instantly put this France team on a massive pedestal. I don't think they're any better than anybody else. Yeah, I I think our our squad probably in most positions does compete with France. The thing that worries me about France is the same thing that worries me about England, which is that, like you say, for the best part of 15 years, we haven't had teams like France and England come to Murrayfield thinking, we need to go there and beat this team. France have got a chip on their shoulder about us after the last two years. England do after last year. They're now, like, previous years, France and England aren't looking at a trip to Murrayfield and going, that's a must-win game, let's get that one in the calendar, we're, go- we're targeting that game. They're They're those teams have traditionally come to Murrayfield and gone, that's fine, we'll get Scotland out of the way, we'll get on to Wales, we'll get on to Ireland. This year, both of those teams are coming to Murrayfield thinking, we need to win this game. And it's how Scotland mentally face up to that, because it's not a challenge that I think we're used to. That's what makes them dangerous, I think. Yeah, I think that's fair, Craig. Yeah, I think, think, you know, we're going to have to get it on our shoulders that, that, that... The favourite tag is the wrong word, but uh, we're no longer the underdog of um, the Six Nations. We're now a team that people have to beat. 
Um, and you know, we'll no long. I don't think we're ever we're, we're, we're ever a team that will will give the game away. Now um, you have to come out and beat us. And I think, as 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 you say, you know, we hear so much that the, the France hype train has been has been rattling along for three years now, and it's not you know they keep they keep coming off the rails. Now I'm not going to say the typical thing of oh it's just it depends what France turns up well I've just said it um but I think I think we we won't have that problem this year I think for, I think France will turn up to play um but I've paid decent money for a ticket this year so the, the we better beat them um so that's a, a, if it's you know that's the way it is um but no I I, th- I, th- I think we have just to say we have to be we have to Take that moniker on of the that we've got the we're just as good as all every single team that's in the Six Nations now. Yeah, do you know what I should say really quickly? Um, not to get all hashtag rugby values, uh, but I am a poor student this year, uh, and Craig and the two guys that we normally go to the game with chipped in to also pay good money for a ticket so I can go, which was very very nice of them. Got a week, got does a week that mean? Present. Does that mean I have to make sure he says nice things about Embra for the rest of the season, then, Craig? <laughs> um, no, and uh, it's it's. I just got fed up of everyone thinking that Johnny and I dislike each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but you know, <laughs> no. Uh, Ian, your take on the France, this France squad, because like J- Johnny and Craig, I mean, there is still an element of which France squad will turn up. It's not that. Uh, a rubbish France will turn up. It's just, you know, Anton Dupont hasn't... I don't actually hear something. I don't think Anton Dupont has ever had a good game against Scotland. Someone will probably tell me I'm wrong, but I think he's probably struggled against Scotland ever since he's come on the scene. He got injured in one game. No, he had. He does have one good game. Uh... Was it the Gary Graham's debut? Well, we got more than France. Like, I remember he he made a great break from the back of a scrum. So, like he sort of gave the eyes to Price earlier and like pulled away and set up a try. Uh, but for me, I think Roman Intermac is as important as Antoine Dupont to France. Um, uh, we we've got a very good record against France of late. Um, I think their style kind of suits us, and as long as we start well. Uh, and don't give away cheap points. We should be all right, even though, like, uh, was it twenty? What year was this? Twenty eighteen, I think. We, we gave away a couple of cheap tries to France and still managed to scrape the win. Uh, I think that was my, one of my first games I went to, uh, right for the blog, and gave Grant Gilchrist man of the match of all things. Um, oh, come on! <laughs> uh, everyone else gave it to Greg Laidlaw. Um, but it's like, man, he just. <laughs> He just kicked the points. It was Gilco made the damage. Um, so we, we do seem to do well against them. Um, obviously, they have cracking players, but then sometimes those cracking players try to crack some faces and make life easier for us, not realising they've had a man with a steel plate in his face. Um, but I get... I mean, I, I, whereas I was definitive that England would be fifth just to noise up any English people listening uh, and Johnny and Craig sat on the fence uh, with France what I'll say is they, they're <laughs> the same thing what they said about England um, you know, if they get momentum they can be terrifying but if they implode uh, that's going to be a real problem uh, who's, who have they got away this year? Uh, France <laughs> France um, are home to Italy, home to Ireland, away to us, away to Wales, and then home to England in the last weekend. So there are right. three three at home, two away. That's the wooden swing game. <laughs> <laughs> away to Wales. Uh, England, England, France. And there's a uh, sloth 3183 saying starting against Italy is a good way to build momentum for France. I, I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think France have had that in the past where they've, they've started really well. They've had games against Italy in the first game in the past and then the wheels have come off, I think, because it gives them false confidence. I think that's sometimes France's problem, which might suit us that they have two big wins and get complacent. I'm actually looking forward to getting to see Intermac for the whole game, though. I think 
the last two games I've been to see, um, I think Intermac first was, was on and then got injured half uh, about a quarter of the way into the game. Um, yeah, and then the second one, he wasn't playing. Yeah, so um, it's, it's, it'll be... Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking forward to actually getting to see him play. Um, hopefully not as good as, uh, as he can be, though. But do you know who um, made the most metres in the top 14 this week, the, um, this season so far, in one game, in a single game? Finn Russell. Finn bloody Russell, that's right. <laughs> Even though people are then slagging him for not scoring that try, did you see it when he did the tap and go? Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. It was inches away from being genius. I think that's that's the thing. Like for all the hyper and Roman Entomac and Matthew Jellibur, they're not even the best fly house playing in France right now. He's Scottish. <laughs> so, <anyway. laughs> um, next up, Italy. I mean, Italy's a strange Just one. I mean, France, best in the world. <laughs> Italy's a strange one. I think. Um, are we over Italy now, Johnny? As a bo- as our bogey team, I kind of feel like we are. Yeah, we. we Thomas Thomas sure. Brown on YouTube. Yes. Yes, yeah. I was actually just looking at that and thinking, yeah, see, it isn't France the front row you fear most of the Six Nations. Absolutely. Thomas, I I don't, I, I've never been, a, uh, I've never feared the front row in my life and I don't think our front row will fear any any front row. I think we'll <laughs> take them on as they come on. No, no, I honestly, I honestly believe that, 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 that um, when you're playing well, you're playing well. I think we don't, um, when you're playing international rugby and you're in international front row, it's very rarely do you, do you struggle in the front row against somebody else? And uh, it's, you, you find a way to play around them. Yeah. Italy, Johnny, are they our bo- They're not a bogey team anymore, I don't think. No. I, like, it's a shame, but I don't think Italy are a bogey team for anybody in the Six Nations at the moment. I think as much as, as this is the closest Six Nations that we've had for a while in terms of who might win, at the same time, I think Italy are further behind the pace than they've been for quite a few years at the moment. But then yeah. their, their oldest fly half is Paolo Garbisi and he's 21, so... <laughs> it's very true. I don't know. Um, they, they seem to be one of these teams, like, they, there are some good individuals in there. Uh, what's, the what's his name again? Miozza? Miozza? I've, I've completely gone. Plays for Wasps. Minotti. Not say that's it, the wee guy, mm. uh, and Garbisi, uh, Jake Pledry used to work in Subway, as you'll always hear in the Six Nations. You should do a sweet take for it. <laughs> um, Sebastian Negri, but it, I don't know. It seems to be sort of almost a Fiji situation. Well, I just maybe not the same quality of individuals, but uh, yeah, I can't. I mean, we're away to Italy, but. I I, mean, I think it's it's the the beyond the point. I think, like you said, Craig, everyone's everyone's taking us serious this year, this year, and I don't think we're the game that Italy can target any more than any what anybody else are going to have to target this year. Whereas I think before they would always have a game plan to to, to make trouble for us. Yeah, I don't think they've maybe got that luxury this time round. No, and no, I think um, I think also it's a double edged sword because I think they've, they've they've regained their physicality. Um, they're, they're, they're quite a the forwards the forward pack are quite a difficult forward pack to play against. Um, uh, they do have the odd slip up here and there, but if you look at what Benetton can do, um, Benetton Benetton can fail some of the biggest teams around if if they're on their game for twenty minutes, thirty ones. minutes. Well, there is Scottish ones as well, yeah, absolutely. But but do you you know what I mean? That they the, the the they just don't have the 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 backup the they don't have the rugby um the, the the depth I hate using the word depth but they don't have that sort of um rug you know rugby clubs producing 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 all the time they're, they're quite they're, they're quite a young rugby nation so it's a difficult thing for them to be but they could be in three four years time quite a significant player the, the all these young guys that are coming through are really showing some uh, fantastic ability, but we'll have to see. But as I say, I, I, you know, I don't think they're going to get very far with uh, with the teams that they're coming up against over the next week. Well, yeah, as Neil Barris goes on our Patreon page, uh, Facebook, saying, "Living in Italy, I get to see a bit of club the club game. They've improved, but so has everyone else. But they will be in the game for sixty. I think that's probably what yeah. Italy need to target this year. He has been in, if they're in, they've got the potential to be in every game for sixty minutes." 
Yeah, they just need to make sure they don't. It's all about this thing, like international games, as we all know now, it's mainly won by defence. If you can hold the team out, if they like, can hold the team out for six minutes, then you've got someone like Monte Ioni, who's a you know great strike runner, a great counter attacker. They can score points, um, but they just need to defend better. Uh, because was I think last year they shipped the most points. Their uh, defense last Tix year was nations. atrocious. Yeah, they just. Um, do you know what it was last year? They just. It was like Cardiff when they came to play Edinburgh. They just looked like they couldn't be arsed. Mm. There was dog uh, legs uh, everywhere. There was like people jogging back in defense. It was terrible, and so it was like that for the loose whole. Loose arms period. getting swung out, just like ah, yeah. he's away. So. Yeah. Um, Ireland then for the last. Now that game, we should say. Um, the last game of the weekend. That's going to be our big, our big live podcast, at the Big Skip Factory in Edinburgh. Um, that's the nineteenth of all right, the nineteenth of March. I should know that's my mum's birthday. Um, <laughs> so we'll be doing the live podcast from the Biscuit Factory in Leith. Um, details for tickets are on the website. We're going to have the guys, the organisers, on the podcast next week, kind of giving us a few details of, of exactly what's going on. Should be some hoping for some former pros along. Um, there'll be us live on the stage. But Got not. WP Nell's catering company along for some biltong and dried South African meat, if that's your thing. But, but not no, no, no. Well, maybe not. I was going to ask him for hair care tips. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, other, though, so, so Ireland is the last game of the weekend, the last game for us on Super Saturday. Um, Craig, Ireland away for Scotland hasn't always been. A happy place to go in recent years. I think the 2020 game wasn't as bad as it felt at the time, maybe, but everything before that has, apart from the time that Dan Parks got that drop goal, has been fairly horrendous. Yeah, yeah. I think um, we had that opportunity to beat them um, in 2020, and Hoggy Hoggy struggled to keep a hold of the ball. Um, and he went over. So there's, that that was an opportunity missed. But we really, I, and they are looking incredibly sharp. Um, you know, they played, uh, I'm trying to think what it wasn't the, the All Blacks I was watching them play against, but it was one of the other teams in the Autumn Nation, the Autumn Nations game, um, at the, the Autumn Nationals, you say, and it was just, they looked, the, the, the speed of ball from the ruck was quite, Something else that, that it may almost made Johnny Sexton unable to run. Um, he was it was so quick. So I think um, I think they look they look very 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 slick at this moment in time. And Andy Farrell's finally getting to put his stamp on them. So you know they I think it'll be the title decider um, between Scotland and Ireland. Um, Johnny McGinty's already going into trouble for saying that. But uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll wait and see. But I I I think I think you know if. I honestly think that Ireland have got a very, very good chance of winning the, winning the, the championship this year. So, you know, uh, uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But, it, um, yeah. I, I I would agree with that. I think Ireland, for me, out of all the teams, I'm confident that we can. I'm not saying we will. I'm confident that we can beat all the other teams except Ireland. That's not saying we will beat them. I'm just confident that we can and we've got the ability to beat all the other teams apart from Ireland. And that's the one sticking point, Johnny, for me is I don't, I can't visualise that happening. And I don't yeah. know, I can visualise us beating every other team. I just can't visualise us beating Ireland. I don't know how that's going to happen. No, I'd see it for me to be, to be perfectly honest, if we have a middling tournament with two or three wins and one of them is beating Ireland, I'd be happy with that. I'd count that as a successful tournament because we've, although we've had some some close on the score line results with Ireland in the last four or five years, we've never really broken down their game plan and we've never really looked like we're in with a chance of winning the game. We've got 18 months to sort that out because we need to beat them in the next World Cup. Yeah. And so... You know, if we if we have a tournament where where we only win a couple of games, but one of them is that we finally unlock how to beat Ireland, I'd be happy enough with that yeah. because that's that for me is the last sort of big thing that we've got to overcome. We just haven't been able to work the game plan out. I don't think, and and that's probably fair because I mean, what we've we've got the the English monkey off our back for want of a better expression mm-hmm. by winning at Twickenham last season. We beat Wales away, albeit in an empty Parker Scarlets 
in 2020, but we still beat Wales on the road. Ireland, I think, are the last. We've beaten France on the road last season. It, it's Ireland are the last kind of team that we need to beat on the road to kind of get that. Uh, I'm in full agreement. Um, Ireland, frankly, terrify me. Um, the Six Nations, uh, yeah, I think they're going to win the tournament. Um, they just, even even when we've played well against them a couple of years ago, and even a couple of years before that, remember, we were right in the game. Uh, Hugh Jones butchered a, an inside pass to Stuart Hogg, and then Pete Horn threw a, an interception to Jacob Stockdale, and that was just you know massive swing on the scoreboard. So they are... Uh, it, it's not just a monkey, a, a silverback gorilla to get off the back. Um, they they seem to get away with murder against us occasionally. Um, uh, but you know, like I said, you know, when we've played well, remember a game a couple of years ago when Hastings had started because of the Finns and um, Sexton was rattled in the first half when we had them on the ropes. But then the second half, I was just like, you know, what's going to happen? I'm like, even though I'm just watching the telly, I'm going to have to strain my neck watching the ball get hoofed up in the air. And that's all they did because they knew they had the better off at that point. Um, and they do seem, seem to know how to beat us. Uh, and it's time we damn well change that. But but like I said, you know, as we've joked, or have we, uh, it could be a Grand Slam decider and a pumped up Ireland. I'd, I'd be really worried about that. Uh, yeah. I, I think they they will they will win it, even if Sexton goes down. Um, well, I mean, obviously he's, he's highly highly unlikely to play every game. Um, but the rest of the his team can dig him out a hole. Uh, I mean, how many how many Leinster players are in that extended squad? Like all yeah. the entire yep. school that they have, they get the farm and that. If we're going to talk about Scotland's mindset, sorry, Greg. No, no, carry on, mate, on you. If we're going to talk about Scotland's mindset and and how it's improving, and it is improving, if somehow the stars align and we're going to Dublin St Patrick's Day weekend, winner takes the tournament against Ireland, you will not get a bigger test than that of how Scotland are mentally prepared now for these big games. Yeah, yeah. I want to kind of finish now with we we talked like I think we've all agreed that Scotland will finish somewhere second between second and fifth. But Craig, <laughs> what what would be what for you, Craig? And I'll ask the others as well. What we get to the end, we sit down at the end of it. What would be the sign of a good tournament for Scotland for you when we're when we're reviewing looking back at this? Um, I think we need to uh, for me. We second or bust. I think if we win it, it'll be fabulous. But I think we should be aiming for a highlight, a, a, you know, a, a, a second, you know, second in the tournament. I think we need to to realise our potential. Everyone keeps talking about Scotland's depth and how we've got some phenomenal players now. We've got this and we've got that and we've got the other. It's now time for Scotland to step up and show us that they are the team that we believe in, that we believe they are. Um, we can't afford to go into this weekend and fold to England. We can't afford to let Wales get whether it's a lucky or a lucky win or grind us down and beat us. We can't afford to um, let France. Um, we can't. Af- we can't afford to expect France to make a, f- a last minute mess up and give us the game. We have to perform. Um, so as far as I'm concerned. Um, this year we we have we have to perform and we have to be we have to release the potential that or realise the potential that everybody is talking about. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, for me, I've said it before. It's it's beating Ireland is. I I would take that as more important than results in this tournament, just because of what we've got coming up in the next eighteen months. We've got another Six Nations. We've got three home games. We've got Ireland in the pool stages of a World Cup, and we need that's the last big thing I think that Scotland need to crack. You know, we've cracked the winning tight games that we previously have been losing. We've cracked the away win at Twickenham. We seem to have France's number somehow for the last few years. Ireland, for all that they're a really great team, 
they've they've got what a lot of the time has looked like quite a beatable game plan for anyone but us or the All Blacks. <laughs> there just seems to be something about Ireland's game that most people seem to go in and have an open game where anything could happen, and us and for some reason New Zealand just haven't been able to hang with it. Well, that's it, yeah, and that's that's what we need to do. We need to figure that out. We need to we need to break that, and if we could do that this year, then we're set up for for an even better year next year. I think. Yeah, Ian. Um, for even though I've just talked up like France uh, about our you know chance against France, uh, I think it'll be Ireland, France, then us, then Wales, then England, then Italy. Yeah. Um, will we beat Wales? Yes, we'll beat Wales, but somehow uh, all on points difference France will finish above us I will win the Grand Slam I reckon Okay, I'm going to say I think the big thing for us this year we need to beat Wales away at the Principality because for all we want at the Parker Scarlet it's, it's it's always going to have an asterisk next to it for me I think Scotland need to win in that atmosphere in that stadium and I, I agree with Craig I think second or bust think Scotland at some point I think I think Scotland fans expectations of Scotland needs to realign and the expectation now should be that we are competitive in a tournament and second is a is a realistic goal for Scotland this year I think third fourth fifth is absolutely fine in the grand scheme of everybody else is just as good as us but I think if, if they're targeting something I think it has to be second I mean, the players obviously target and winning the thing, which is which is absolutely fine. But it's yeah, I think I agree with Craig. I think second or bust. I think I think you also have to look at the fact that if, if, if Johnny's saying, well, you know, um, when you know beating Ireland this year, if we can beat Ireland, we should be happy. Um, not ha- I'm paraphrasing phrasing you, Johnny here, but um, as far as I'm concerned, if we're beating Ireland this, if we're beating Ireland in Dublin. Um, we should be winning it. Yeah. Um, because Ireland are the team. I, I honestly do believe. Um, no, you know, people are put, saying that France are the team. I don't think so. I think Ireland are the team that beat this year. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, that's that's our round of the Six Nations. We should quickly say we've run slightly run out of time. I was going to touch on the, the under twenties um, Six Nations team that's been announced. There's there's a Berwick and a Howe player on the bench, Johnny. We got there is yeah yeah so we uh, we've got Callum Norrie who played with us and then went away to Strathallan can never remember yep. what it is Strathallan um, and yeah his his dad is a teammate of mine and Craig's so very pleased to see him yeah we've got Ben Evans whose dad Charlie's a, a coach at Berwick as well so um wish them all the best of luck obviously clearly the the, the two powerhouse teams in Scotland once again providing for the national setup which is good to see. <laughs> absolutely absolutely um but look they, we're, we're going to move on now um we've, we've run out of time a little bit that's that's the end of our six nations preview podcast for this week um we will be back on friday um some of us to preview the scotland england game once we know both teams we'll have a bit more of an in-depth chat about that and um, that'll be available for audio download for um everybody um, but uh, patrons will get to watch along live as well and we'll post details of when you can watch that um, sometime on Friday morning um, we will be back next week with like I said we'll have the full Calcutta Cup review preview of the Wales match we're going to have the guys who are organising the um, the watch party at the Biscuit Factory to come along and tell us what we can expect for that and more details of, of what you, your money will buy you if you buy a ticket for it and um, what we can and cannot see yes <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so, um, but like I said, we'll be back next week. Patreons, anybody watching live on the Patreons um, stream, uh, we will have a normal comfort break of five, ten minutes, and then we'll be back with the rest of the podcast. But for the moment, for this week, it is goodbye from me, goodbye from Craig, Ian, and Johnny. Well, bye. bye. Come on, Scotland. You don't even.